What's up guys, Rogue9 here and in this video I want to cover another set of hidden features in Rainbow Six Siege that the game just never tells you about in any way. I already covered 10 such features in a previous video, check out a link to that in the end card, but there are many more to cover so why don't we just make this a series. And with that, let's get stuck in with part 2. This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the only men's brand dedicated to below-the-waist grooming and hygiene. They've sent me their all-in-one kit of manscaping supplies, the Perfect Package 3.0, which comes with everything a man could want to take his grooming routine to the next level. The centerpiece of the package is the Lawnmower 3.0, their third generation waterproof body trimmer which comes with a ton of practical features such as a built in LED light at the top to allow for maximum precision and high quality ceramic blades built with skin safe technology to prevent nicks, cuts and snags. The package they sent me also included the Crop Cleanser, the Crop Preserver and the Crop Reviver. I've been trying all three of these products and I'm loving the great scent and fresh feel they provide. But the thing that has surprised and impressed me the most in the Perfect Package 3.0 is the complimentary pair of patented, high-performance, anti-chafing Manscaped boxers. The comfort and support they provide even during high-intensity activities such as working out in the gym, running or playing Siege is probably the best I've ever experienced and I'll be using my own discount code to order myself a few more packets of these. Am I allowed to do that? Meh, we'll see how it goes. So if you want to level up your grooming game, check out manscaped.com with the link in the description below and you can get 20% off plus free shipping for your perfect package 3.0 purchase when you use the promo code ROGUE at checkout. In a recent video where I tested everything you need to know about breaching walls, I discovered that if you reinforce a wall and attach a mirror window, nothing happens to the sound. the wall still blocks just about all of it. But if you create a hole in the soft part of the wall, either before or after reinforcing, and then you apply a mirror window, you will be able to hear sound through that window as if the wall was completely open. So not only do you have full vision of what's on the other side, but you will also get much better audio cues. Neat! Keep in mind though that this is almost certainly unintended behaviour and the devs have already announced that they are looking to fix this in future. And while we're at it, we might as well also talk about some other breaching and sound propagation quirks that are still in the game right now. When you create holes in a soft wall before reinforcing over it, you will get much better sound propagation than if you reinforce a solid wall. And that makes perfect sense, I guess. The drywall or wooden panels that make up the intact wall will absorb sound much more than the metal barricade would. But one thing that does not make sense is that in places where the metal reinforcements only reach part of the way up to the ceiling, the sound dampening effect of the reinforcement still applies even though there is a very obvious gap at the top. So here's the summary, mirror windows alone won't let sound through but as soon as you shoot a hole in the soft part, sound will come through the window as if it was open. Reinforcements will muffle the sound of an open wall even if there is still a gap at the top. The other Spanish operator in Siege, Jackal, may also have a couple of little weaknesses that you might never have thought about. The first one makes complete sense but is still worth mentioning. If you're roaming as a defender and you know that the enemy will be bringing out a Jackal, it can make sense in certain situations to walk backwards. This will leave footprints that are facing the wrong way and can help mask the direction you were actually moving in. Furthermore, if you really want to avoid leaving behind a trail, you can choose to crawl instead of walking. This will make you pretty slow, noisy and vulnerable, but can still be worth it if it's early enough in the round and you really don't want to leave any footprints behind while you're sneaking to some ambush point. 
Echo's drones are not only hard to spot and can provide invaluable information to the defending team, but he can also fire out concussive blast waves that will disorient anyone it hits and interrupt their current actions such as planting the diffuser or placing a breach charge. So far so good, right? But something that some players still get confused about is that if you're hit by one of these blasts, the best thing is to stay as still as possible. The more you move, and especially the faster you move, the worse the stun effect will be. You will have an immediate sway effect added in and the black vignette around your screen will become larger, plus the effect will last much, much longer. Contrary to some beliefs though, lying down will not make you recover any faster, it's all just about movement speed. Unlike pretty much all other projectiles in the game, Capitao's fire and smoke bolts and Hibana's ex Kairos breaching pellets are not intercepted by Jaeger's active defense system and neither are Gridlock's track stingers. Wamai on the other hand can intercept Capitao and Gridlock's gadgets but still has no effect on Hibana and while this might be a minor point to players who have hundreds or even thousands of hours in the game, little inconsistencies like this are a huge factor in making the game difficult for new players to pick up. Movement speed is another topic that is probably more complex than most players realize. Sure, there are three different types of armor ratings in the game, and the lighter the armor, the faster the character can move. Okay, but then there is the additional feature that switching to your secondary weapon makes your operator around 5% faster than their baseline speed, but only if it's a pistol. Machine pistols and mini shotguns do not count, although the bailiff does because it's basically a revolver. So switching to a pistol will make your operators move faster, but here's the thing. While you're going through the switching animation, your operator is unable to sprint and the time you lose while changing guns actually ends up consuming some of the advantage you will get from moving faster. So the question is, how far do you have to run before it makes sense to switch weapons? Time for some experiments. I ran several trials comparing the running speed with the primary weapon, the secondary weapon and while switching. The time saving over various distances for 3 speed operators was between 4.37% and 4.45% and the cost of switching guns mid run was consistently 166 milliseconds or 10 frames in my 60 fps recording. So in theory you need to run a distance where the time saving of running with the pistol is equal to or greater than the cost of switching guns. We know that the cost is 166 milliseconds and that must be greater than or equal to a running time of x minus x with the pistol which according to our tests is around 4.5% faster. Solve this equation for x and we receive a minimum required running time of between 3.729 and 3.795 seconds which for 3 speeds translates into 17.62 to 17.94 meters. So as long as the distance you need to go is greater than 18 meters, switching to your pistol will start saving you a little bit of time in terms of reaching your destination. Let's just confirm that in a practical test in this hallway, it's about 18 meters and without switching the time is 3.71 seconds and with switching... 3.7 seconds. A difference of one frame in my test footage, not bad, I'll take that. But of course if you want to use your primary weapon again once you get to where you want to be, you will have to switch back to that and that's another 166 milliseconds on top, so then you will need to double the minimum distance before you start saving time. That's 36 meters or more for 3 speed ops and even then you'll really only start saving fractions of a second with each additional meter. My very first test at 69 meters kind of proves this because even over a respectable distance like that, the time reduction was less than half a second and that was without switching back to my primary at the end. The upshot of all of this is that in reality you will almost never benefit significantly from switching to your pistol to travel faster at least not with just regular operators. Because finally, in addition to all of this, there are also a number of characters that have their own speed penalties. Shield operators are another 20% slower than their armor would normally dictate, and even though this penalty still applies when the shield is slung onto their backs, the vastly slower speed of a 1 speed op with shield compared to a 3 speed means that you will only need to travel around 18.5 meters in order to start saving time with either Monty or Fuse when weapon switching twice, and for Blitz that distance is 23.3 meters. 
Blackbeard will also experience a 20% speed nerf once he attaches one of his ballistic glass panels to his rifle, and Kali has a default speed nerf of 10% in place anytime she is using her big ass sniper rifle, so for both of these operators, switching to the sidearm when moving and not expecting any sudden engagement can well be worth it. Over to Mute, you know, the guy whose jammers stop drones and can defend reinforced walls from being breached. Although, maybe you don't actually know that. I once used some mute footage in the background of one of my videos and was a little surprised at the number of people who made fun of me for placing the anti-drone devices next to reinforced walls. In fairness though, most players probably do know about this dual role. Nevertheless, there are quite a number of lesser known features about mute jammers as well. Not only do they block drones and breaching charges from going off, but they can also disrupt quite a number of other attacker gadgets. First of all, not only do the jammers disrupt the drones themselves as they drive into their reach, but if an attacker tries to use their drones from within the radius of a jammer, the phone signal itself is blocked and they will not be able to drone. And this blocking effect also goes for a whole number of different actions. Dockerby, Jackal, Finker, Blitz, and Lion will not be able to use their abilities as long as they are within the range of a mute jammer. Plus, the jammer will offer a safe haven to any defender that is within their reach, and neither Dokkabee's calls nor Lion Drone Scans will be able to affect these protected players. Fuse's cluster charges are blocked from being activated just like any breaching charges, and I guess that makes sense. But there are a whole bunch of electronic devices and breaching gadgets that will still work. Nook's cloaking device. Nomad's air jabs. Ash's breaching grenades. Zofia's impact and stun grenades. and Kali's projectiles, IQ's device scanner, Glaz's IR scope, Ying's candelas, and Claymore's. They are all completely immune to the influence of Mute's jammers because why not? I guess for some of these devices it makes sense that they're not affected, but if Jackal can't use his visor, then IQ and Glass should also be affected. And if Barbed Wire can give away Nurk, then a jammer should at least do the same if not completely disable her ability. But I guess some of these inconsistencies are down to balancing, and even though they can cause a lot of confusion, the balancing downsides to standardizing the effects for these operators could well cause their own problems. Kali is the most recent addition to Team Rainbow at the time of the making of this video, and yet there are still inconsistencies about her that will start to stump newer players in the not so distant future. We've already discussed her movement speed penalty with her primary weapon, and this gun has a whole set of other features that are unique. It will always down a target with one shot to the upper body, no matter how far away that person is or how many walls the bullet had to penetrate first. Each shot also causes instant impulses, the term Ubisoft uses for larger holes in soft walls, and they can penetrate through a number of soft walls, unlike all other guns that can now only go through one wall before being stopped. Finally, the bullets from the CSRX can also penetrate and take down all five operators on the enemy team in one shot, and can also open barricades and hatches in a single shot. Sure, these are all features of her special primary weapon, but sooner or later I can see these unique aspects causing confusion with newer players.
Thatcher is another potential source of confusion, especially with his gadget being nerfed not so long ago. With so many different types of electronic gadgets in the game right now, it can be challenging to know which ones are destroyed by the MP Blast and which ones are merely disabled. So here's a full list of gadgets and how they're affected. I will be releasing this graphic along with a bunch of others from past projects on my Instagram, so do leave a follow there if you want a nice little condensed feed of all of my findings going forward. Another thing to note about Thatcher's EMPs is that they will also temporarily disable electronic weapon attachments on any defender caught in the blast. If you're on defense, you will get a little debuff timer in the bottom left hand corner and while that is active, your electronic sights as well as your laser pointers will be switched off and yes, during that time, the hip fire advantage you get from the laser will also be temporarily disabled. And that's about one video's worth of additional hidden features and little tricks. If you know any more that you think are worth covering in future, leave a comment below and until then, many thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next episode.